Can everyone welcome out for Couch Candy, Jen Candy. Great John Candy. We love you. Aw, thank you. He loves you too, and so do I. So, thank you. <laughs> now, tonight's guest I'm very excited about. He was in the Second City Touring Company. He's in one of the longest running improv group groups, Off the Wall, and he's worked with everyone from Jim Belushi to Robin Williams, the very talented Tom Tully. <laughs> at a viral short that uh, Tom is in with Keegan-Michael Key called I Am LA. I'm a soccer mom and a news anchor. I am LA. I'm an aviator and an anchorman. I am LA. I'm a grandfather and my girlfriend just graduated college. I am LA. I am LA. I am LA. I am LA. LA, we're inappropriate is okay. Give a round of applause for Tom Tully! Woo! Come on out, Tom! Woo! Woo! Oh, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Take a seat. I asked all my guests what their favorite candy is, and uh, we got an answer we don't normally get. Uh, uh, you know, I ordinarily don't eat candy, but I drink a lot. So, you, so that white kind of where all the sugar goes. White wine with a bounce, to be exact. But I see you have candy. I do have candy. These are wine gums for all of you guys because I didn't Ooh. have enough to share of the white wine. <laughs> um, but wine gums are—it's a British candy and also a Canadian candy that don't have real alcohol in them, but they're like a gummy bear, and so it's wine with a bounce. <laughs> So there we go. Well, right. welcome. Thank you so much Thank for, you. for doing this, Tom. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, so you started off um, at Second City in the touring company. Right. Well, uh, I worked with Del Close. He okay. was a great director. And actually, he started off another company called the Reification Company. Okay. And the, and uh, that's where I worked with uh, Bernadette Briquet and Danny Breen and all those people. Uh, and um, I did a touring company in Europe, basically. Really? Yes. We Normally. had a lot of fun. They and, start uh, off, you know, just in a van in Wisconsin and I know, but you I went know. you went to Europe. I was very fortunate and uh, we we played in Vienna. Wow. Which was really an interesting city because they were great audiences, but very dull when you met them. <laughs> so it's very odd. I never quite understood that. And of course in Ireland I did the like, the second city of thing in Kilkenny okay. three times. Really? Yeah, so that was really fun. And I've also done a festival up in uh, Edinburgh. Wow. You know, with my group off the wall, so that's a lot of fun. That's amazing. Now, what when you were on tour with Second City out there? Um, was, did any was there any crazy stories that happened? Yes, I, you know, I forgot until just just before you <laughs> mentioned you were going to ask me that. I realized here's what happened. Um, <laughs> this is Tully Castle, and that it's in Ireland, and so uh, there, we had a day off in Ireland. Now we now the the deal is Michael McCarthy put together a group with Timmy Kazarinski and George Went. And the second year, Bill Murray did, was the, hosted it, but George was the first year. And anyway, so I went the first year with the gang, and I rented a car. And we had a day off, and I was going to drive up to Tully Castle, which is in the north. Now, you have to understand, it's two, two countries in one little area. So that Northern, Northern Ireland is not Ireland, but the borders are open. So I drove through Northern Ireland, and I stayed the night in Kilkenny. And then I came back down early in the morning, and uh, I, I stayed up in uh, Donegal, excuse me, and uh, I, I left Donegal, and then I went to Tully Castle, which is this castle right here. Yeah, here, I can hold it up for oh, you good. Tully Castle. And so there it is. It's a ruin, of course. You know, the Tullys murdered everybody centuries ago. <laughs> and, um, but there were the, the McKeever brothers. We had, oh, a sheep, had a bunch of sheep out there. And they go, oh, you're here to retake the castle, are you? you know? And so <laughs> we laughed and thought, oh, that's good. So now I'm going to get back to the show. And, uh, and, and um, you know, I didn't know that this was the one day ever that Prince Charles chose to visit uh, Dublin. And of course they didn't pre-announce that, but they thought word had gotten out and that they were sending a gunman down from the north. And I had a rented car. And you have to understand on a bank holiday, which this was in Ireland, there's nobody on the roads at all. It's amazing. And so I was the only car coming. And so they stopped me 
and the, and they had about six or seven guys with Uzis right on top of me, like boom, like that, you know, before I have a chance to do anything. And a very nice guy with a beret and uh, a mustache came out and he said, oh, good morning. And uh, I said, good morning. And, and I realized I hadn't identified myself as an American yet. And he goes, uh, where are you headed? And, and of course, I was, I was gonna go to Kilkenny, you know? And now I'm looking at the Uzis pointed right at me and my throat gets really tight. And so I honestly got a true story. I go, uh, I'm gonna kill them. Um, I'm going to kill them. Um, and I, I couldn't get Kenny up. I couldn't get, so I'm, I'm, and these guys get real tense, you know? I'm gonna kill, I'm gonna kill, I'm going to kill. And the guy goes, are you going to kill Kenny? I said, yes. Yes, I'm, you're going to the comedy festival. Yes, and you're an American. Yes, I'm an American, <laughs> and I love everyone. You know? <laughs> and Sweat they dripping. Were, honest to God, yeah. Luckily, I hadn't had anything for breakfast, bro. But, <laughs> that would have been uh, on their shoes. That would have been on point. their shoes. Yeah, and so that was a horror story that I uh, that I re just remembered before you. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's hysterical. That's a true story. I'm gonna kill. Oh, tongue tied like that. Was how long were you traveling in Europe with? Well, you know what everyone? we we, we uh, uh, in Vienna. We were there for a couple of weeks, and then we got to go up to Prague, and that was it. Was great fun. And then you know, with, with Off the Wall, we played in London, and then we played in the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is total ripoff, but <laughs> it's worth it. It was just worth it. We rented a, a beautiful old house that was 500 years old and had like really tall steps, you know, and you oh, went wow. upstairs and. And it was just worth it being there. The people were really nice. And I, I, I always, if you ever get the chance to go to a comedy festival, or a music festival, of course, go. Just go. Find a way to go, because they're always great. They're always great and different. And is it true that Joyce uh, Salone, the mother of Second City, she traveled with you of guys course. with this one? Oh, yes. She, she, was, she found uh, the opportunity to go somewhere Joyce outside. went back a long way to, from, with Second City, and she was really the gal that got the, the groups going during the week, you know, to see the shows. She'd go to women's luncheons, and she'd go, you guys should come see uh, Second City with Mike Nichols and Elaine May and all. And, and she really got the whole thing right. on a professional level. So she loved Vienna because, you know, they had pastries there. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, she loved, uh, she loved Vienna very much. Now, Fred Kaz, who was our piano player, right. was con they lost his luggage, and he was convinced. <laughs> He was convinced it was a German conspiracy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they found out he was Jewish, and he was, you know, that. But we love Fred. Fred Kaz was a wonderful piano player. Yes, he was. He was time. amazing. I loved Fred. Okay. Uh, now, I want to do something. It's a little okay. game that we call Story Time. Okay. Uh, the game is we're going to show a photo Great. of a person, and you are going to tell a story about them. Super. Great? Okay. Absolutely. So I'm going to start with my personal favorite, my dad. Your dad. Good friend of mine. Because you've got some great stories. I've got, I've got, I've got, I'm going to ramble through these, but I've got a couple of stories about your dad. And um, your dad had four groups of friends, I realized. He had his family, who he was totally committed to. And, of course, he had the people that he worked with, Eugene. Yep. And uh, all those guys knew him much better than I did. And then he had his fans, you know. And then he had people that he liked to party with. <laughs> and I was in that fourth group, you know, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, yeah, and I'll tell you a great story. He was out here doing a movie, and they were shooting down at the Sixth Street Bridge, you know, downtown. Okay. And so uh, your dad wanted to take a nap in the afternoon. So he said, uh, wake me up for my shot, and they go, fine. And, and, you know, he was so proud because he was finally doing the lead, you know, name above the title starring John Candy. And, uh, but it wasn't a big budget production, okay? Right. So that when he woke up, everybody was gone. And there was an African-American security guard, an older gentleman, who was sitting there. And John comes out in his robe, you know, and he goes, where the hell is everybody? And the guy goes, hey, who are you? He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm John Candy. I'm the star of this movie. Where the hell is everybody? He says, oh, Mr. Candy. Oh, yes, sir. They all went home. Yep, yep. They wrapped for the day. He goes, God damn it. So this is before cell phones. So he found a phone. And he calls me and said, and I said, I said, John, you know, this isn't, you know, going with the wind, okay? You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna have uh, that that stuff. But another quick story is we were in Chicago, and uh, we were up all night. I'm not gonna tell you what we were doing, but we were up all night. Yes. And so your dad wanted to go to this restaurant in downtown Chicago. It was right by the L where people come off to go to work in the morning, and they stream off like hundreds and hundreds of people walking past. So we go to this restaurant, I go, geez, do we have to be here? Yeah, yeah, yeah come on, come on. Oh, they know me, Louise, Louise, yeah. And, and so this old gal puts us up right where John wants to sit, right, you know, uh, where the, the window is. So we can see everybody walking past. And believe me, you don't want to work in Chicago on a nice day like that. They were 
everybody was mad that they had to go to work. It was 7.30 in the morning, you know, and you could see them walking by angry to have to go to work. And your dad, of course, ordered everything on the menu twice <laughs> and uh, sits there beaming, you know, and, Rough night. and I go, John, why are we here? I'm tired. What are, you, what are we doing? And he goes, uh, uh, oh, uh, I want to watch these people go to work because I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, that's another true story. <laughs> oh, the other story. All right, so I was at law school at the time. I'm, I you know, went to DePaul Law School you in, were in also Chicago. A lawyer. Yeah, I am. And um, so, anyway, so John was in town and he was at the Second City. I'm trying to remember everything that happened that night. And uh, he was going to do the set, but it was a Saturday, so he had to sit through two shows in order to do that. So he didn't want to do that. So he goes to the, um, you know, he's hanging out in, in the in Second City in Chicago, and he sees me slipping out the back. He goes, Tony, Tony, where are you going? And I go, John, yeah, yeah, I'm going to a, a party. He goes, oh, a party? What about it? Where? Tell me. It's the middle of winter, you know. I go, oh, you don't want to go. It's, an, it's this girl from Northwestern that I know, and she's rich. And, it's, 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 it's up in a high rise, but they're all law students, you know? And he goes, no, 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 I wanna go, I wanna go, I wanna go. I said, all right, fine. <laughs> so, you know, your dad used to wear this big coat, you know, in the yep. winter time. And so the two of us together looked like Mutt and Jeff. And he, <laughs> he so we're, I'm driving over, and I had a beater of a car, you know, because I went to the poor law school, and I didn't have any money. So anyway, so he goes, oh, uh, let, let's, stop, let's bring something. I go, oh, no, no, they're millionaires. They got this, it's a whole floor. The elevator opens up, and, and you're right there. It's like the 34th floor. You don't have to bring anything. He goes, no, no, I'm from Canada. We always bring something. I said, okay. Very right. polite. True story. And so he, he gets four quarts of Black's beer. And that's a Chicago beer, very hardcore, you know. And I go, geez, really? You know, they put them in the bag. And so we go up on the 34th floor, and, we, and the elevator opens. There's a Spanish tile floor. And by now, because it was snowing out, the bag was, was wet. And so as we go into the party, the bag breaks and smashes on the floor. Four quarts of black beer smashing, marking our entrance, you know. And everybody, all these hootsie tootsie law students and their what a family turn around and they're who are these? Oh my God! It's John Belushi. John, I'm not. I forgot John Candy. And they were like so happy that it was your dad. Yeah. And they, you know, that he, they just totally uh, forgave him. They forgave him. him for ruining the. Uh, the right, right. The Spanish tile on the floor. Now I contrast that with another friend of mine who was also equally interested in, in late night affairs, John Belushi. Oh yeah. And uh, I'll tell you a quick John Belushi story that... Um, he's on the list, too. He's on the list, and um, he's somewhere there. You can get there he is. Here he is. Very good. All right. What <laughs> are you, uh, now, I must tell you, that, uh, and because uh, I guess enough time has passed that we can actually be honest about this, your dad and John Belushi didn't always get along. And uh, it wasn't just an ego thing, although male improvisers are really known for being competitive. Yeah. You know, I mean, Bill Murray, my God. So, uh, <laughs> you have no idea. The truth comes out the here, The competition comes out. level, you know, of fighting that would go on. But, you know, he, John Belushi became a star first, see? And so your dad used to call him Little Johnny, you know, because they were both John. And so he was in, the, your dad was in the Blues Brothers, yep. but John Belushi was the lead of the yep. Blues Brothers. But to give you an idea about, about John Belushi, I did remember a story. And uh, uh, he was doing the Blues Brothers, and I picked him up. And so we, uh, we went in this uh, uh, east side neighborhood, you know, and it was a working man's bar. We were driving by, and Belushi goes, oh, stop here, I want to get a drink. I go, I said, no, I said, let's wait till we get to Rush Street, okay, let's, we don't have to go here. This is like working guys walking like a scene. He says, believe me, this is what, not where we want to be. Not where you want to be. And he goes, uh, no, I don't care, come on. So uh, we go, I said, all right, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll go anywhere. So <laughs> 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 apparently, so uh, we go into this bar, and I have all these guys doing shots and drinking beer, you know, and they could care less about us. So we walk up, and I'm trying just to get in and get a, get a drink and get out. And it just so happened there was a Korean War movie on, and it, it, they weren't watching it or anything. It was the the, the uh, sound was off, but it was like a Van Heflin movie from 1954, <laughs> and a real obscure Korean War movie. But John Belushi knew every war movie ever wow. made, and so uh, we walk in. There's a scene: a guy, is, an American soldier, is dying on a hill, and he's got his buddy with him, and they're talking, you know. And so John Belushi walks in, and he goes, um, he goes like this. He goes. What's the matter with you guys? And every one of the guys go, who is this maniac, you know? 
So John, he rips the cigarette out of this guy's hand, which is like fighting words in Chicago. And, and he gets on the bar, and he looks at all the guys, and he puts the cigarette in the mouth of the dying soldier. <laughs> which he must have known that movie by heart to do. What are the odds he could pull that off? And so every one of those guys started laughing and cheering us. But I mean, that's the kind of thing that your dad or John Belushi would bring up anywhere you brought them. They would make it into a party, you know. Yeah. It was like a grand very, very entrance scene. always and everywhere. And Eugene always said that John Candy was the one person that he knew who, that his personality transcended into the films he did. Mm -hmm. And even though he's a great actor, and we saw him in JFK yep. do really good parts, he really uh, was able to portray himself. You yes, know, that and is very true. People love that. They loved it very much. That was always one of the great things about him is because he was able. You, saw him that was in, his, in, in, his, in his films, yeah, like whatever absolutely. part he was working on. Okay, next. Okay. Catherine O'Hara. Oh my God, I'll have a quick Catherine O'Hara story. Of course I was in love with Catherine O'Hara. <laughs> Everyone and, was. Um, that was more many years after that. But anyway, so I wanted to take her out, and so we went to a, I took her to a, uh, her only baseball game that she's ever been to, which was at Wrigley Field, where the Cubs game it was May 19th, 1979. It's a very famous game. The Cubs lost 23 to 22. Oh. And uh, I remember in the fourth inning, the Cubs were up 17 to four. And Catherine couldn't believe the crowd was going crazy. She said, are all the games like this? I said, yeah, they're all like this. And then they wound up losing 23 to 22. And I said, you know what? They're all like this. <laughs> Maureen O'Hara. Oh, Maureen O'Hara. Now, you know, Maureen O'Hara worked with your dad. Yes, only the lonely. Only the lonely. And she was a great, great person. You know, she got stuck over here. She, Irish people love, love, love their families. And poor Maureen came here in 1938, and she became a star, and then the war broke out. So she couldn't get back to Ireland, and she was very upset about that. She said, oh, Tom, they wouldn't let me go. And finally, both Zanuck and the, and the State Department said, all right, 1947, and she got to go back to Ireland. And then just at the last second, Daryl Zanuck goes, no, I got a picture for her. And she goes, and I refuse to do it. I refuse. But then it was Miracle on 34th Street. Oh. And she goes, and you know, that's the only film people remember me for, that and being John Wayne's wife. You know. Yep. But, um, but when she worked with your dad, uh, see, Maureen always, her trademark was her red hair. So she didn't have red hair her whole life. She lived to be like 93. But she dyed her hair. And she had, on the set, she told me uh, that she had, a, she had her own hair person who was always, every shot, you know, Maureen right. had her hair person. So she was getting ready to do a shot in Only the Lonely, yeah. when she played your, your dad's mom, and her hair person's nowhere to be found. And she goes, where's my hair person? And, and, and she goes, well, she's, she's cutting John's hair in the trailer. <laughs> and she goes, well! And she goes into the trailer, you know, and she's got her script. And she goes, you big lummox! Don't you take my hair person! She hit your dad on the head. <laughs> with the script, you know. And so she takes her hair person out of it. So of course, your dad, being your dad, has them put on this huge bandit, and they put blood stains on the You know, that she had uh, injured him greatly. But she loved him very much and thought the world was Oh yeah, I remember being on that set, and it was so much fun, and my oh. hair was amazing. And oh yeah. It's just so, I remember she always had a pocket full of sweets or candies, oh, and she's yeah. just so. like, I don't always have it, but here, try these. And, which is amazing. I love her dearly. Uh, next, Johnny Carson. Okay, well, very quickly, Johnny, I didn't know that well at all, of course. However, uh, Johnny would drink, and I think that's pretty well known. <laughs> and he went to the improv one night, and he got drunk, and this happened more than once. And so, <laughs> so Bud said, I need two guys to drive Johnny Carson back to his house. And I said, what do you need two guys for? He goes, well, he, you know, one of you has to drive him and the other has to drive Johnny's car. I said, well, I'll drive the car. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, I, it was a Rolls Royce, of course, and I'd never driven a Rolls Royce. And so I was new in town, you know. And so Bruce or something took Johnny, and they gave me the address, and I said, I'll just follow you. And of course, the minute we got up, I took the car back into Hollywood, and I was going around. <laughs> and then I go to Santa Monica, and I visit my girlfriend. Hey, here we are. And so Bruce is like, where were you, man? I said, I'm sorry, I got lost. Here's the car. You know. So I did deliver the car, but that was Johnny. Yeah. But that was Johnny. Uh, I've got, there's, you have so many amazing stories. Well, I'll tell you a quick Johnny Carson story yeah. that uh, he actually told it about himself at the uh, round table at, at, the, at the improv. Yep. And that was that uh, um, 
Rod, Rodney Dangerfield was doing a show, and he loved Rodney. But of course, they would imbibe before the show, right? So they're drinking before the uh, Tonight Show, and the and TV comes on, the news that Carl Walinda, the 67-year-old the, uh, uh, patriarch of the Flying Walindas, has fallen to his death in Hawaii, you know, doing the tightrope uh, uh, for a benefit. And, and Carson goes, benefits. And Dangerfield goes, they'll kill you every time. <laughs> Love it. I'm interested to hear about the story about JFK. Well, that actually was a, uh, an event that happened. I turned 10 in Tennessee in 1960. Yeah, and December 23rd. And so we went down to Florida, you know, and we were from Chicago, and we were a big Irish family. And uh, JFK had been elected, but he hadn't been sworn in yet. So he and Jackie and the and, uh, family were down you know, in Miami. And my dad and the Cubans hadn't come so much, so it wasn't a Catholic city yet. It was pretty much a Protestant city. And my dad didn't like crowds, so he had read uh, that, that there were two churches on the north side of Miami, and, he, and they said which church he was going to go to. So he said, well, let's go to the other church. We don't want to, I mean, that was my dad, he didn't want to deal with it. Well, of course, at the last second, the, the, the Secret Service switched churches. And so I got there and I saw him in the back. He was in the back pew. He was really, he was an amazing looking man, just glowing. I thought, wow. And my brothers bet me that I wouldn't run to the crowd and grab him by the legs, you know. And so I said, all right, you're 10 years old, you're right here, you can do anything. And so I did. I ran him up and I grabbed him and, uh, and, 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 and uh, he patted me on the head. The Secret Service guy grabbed me and, and, and Jack goes, oh, that's all right. He goes, hello there, young fella. And uh, patted my head and that was it. That was, uh, my JFK story. <laughs> That's a great JFK story. It, it did happen. A lot of people have JFK stories. <laughs> Thank you. We have a photo of him there. So I can oh, wow. That's amazing. Have her back. Oh, JFK. Mel Brooks. Well, Mel was, uh, was terrific. I just I wrote his name down because everybody loves Mel so much. But uh, uh, I just remember going to Kenny Mars' uh, um, uh, memorial service. Mm -hmm. And he was supposed to go. Uh, and then he was going to go and do a uh, talk between Young Frankenstein and one of the other films. Right. And so he didn't show up. And so my girlfriend at the time, Josie, uh, and I went to, uh, we were going to go to the screening of it, but we couldn't get in too many people. So we went across the street to have uh, coffee. And he was there, and he was because he was going to speak between uh, things, you know. And I said, oh, you know, Fred Willard said hi, and Dick Benjamin, you know, I'm sure that they would say, say hi. They were just a at Kenny Mar oh, you were at Kenny Mars Memorial? And, and he wanted to know all about the memorial. And then l l later on, I, uh, Josie told me, you know, he, I think he was more interested in me, actually. I went, oh, okay. <laughs> and, you know, because uh, I thought, wow, he's really interested in me. But actually, she was a very pretty gal. And I think that was <laughs> pretty <laughs> much. Something else. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Uh, another Brooks, Albert Brooks. Albert Brooks. Oh, my God, yes. Who well, I love. We love Albert Brooks. And he is hysterically funny. It's funny how all these funny people have have eccentricities. Yes, they do. And Albert used to show, go up, go over to the Melrose Improv, and it was during the early days of cable. And he followed us. Off the, off, I did off the wall there uh, for like 14 years. And um, every Monday night for three hours we did improv. And so we were quite famous for it. But um, anyway, uh, he would follow us, and he would get on stage and talk endlessly and empty the theater. You know, eventually people would just leave. <laughs> But uh, my good, I told that to my friend uh, Don Richmond, who was the head of this uh, advertising agency called Richmond and Valour, and he told me this great Albert Brooks story. I'll tell you now that uh, Albert Brooks' first job, because uh, Albert Brooks' dad was a comedian, and his older brother, of course, is uh, is a, is a well-known uh, Super Dave Super Osborne. Super Dave Osborne. Yep. And so uh, they needed a, a high school voice kid to do a radio commercial, and so uh, you know um, his older brother. Uh, Super Dave said, oh, you know, my kid brother wants to get in the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, Albert Einstein was his name at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, he's in high school. He said, no, no, we need a high school voice. So he comes in, and he does the commercial for them, this radio spot. Yeah. And he's perfect. He does it beautifully. And they said, oh, my God, you're great. You know what? We rarely, right, we, we never use a high school kid's voice. But I'll tell you what, if we ever do, we're going to use you, OK? Because you did a really nice job, and I'm glad you got your union card, and congratulations. So about six weeks later, his, uh, Chuck and Don, uh, were, uh, Richmond and Valora, were driving down Hollywood Boulevard, going past Hollywood High School. And so Albert Brooks pulls up right next to them, and he's in a convertible, and Don goes, hey, that's the kid we used, you know, that's his brother. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hey, Albert, how you doing? And Albert goes like this. 
Oh, hi. Oh, we're going to use you. Oh, sure. We'll call you. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and they sit there. <laughs> Can you believe that happened? But I believe it happened. I do believe it happened. <laughs> you know. I want to know the story about Tennessee Williams. Well, Tennessee Williams was uh, quite a character. Now, we all know the Del Close story, that Del was going to meet Tennessee in, he, in Chicago, and he put on a coat he hadn't worn for many years, and Del Close was a very eccentric Ex yes. uh, director in Second City, you know, and he had been a big drug addict, and he, was, he had been <laughs> with the committee in, in San Francisco, legendary New York, and, and anyway, so he put this coat on, he goes in to meet Tennessee Williams, and he sticks out his hand, and a cockroach comes out <laughs> of the coat. And Del goes, oh, uh, I believe that's mine. <laughs> and, and Tennessee, well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Because others may have thought it was me, you know. So. <laughs> but then Tennessee Williams came back to Chicago, uh, and um, my friend was, the director, you know, working at, not Paul, but Loyola. And they were, he was going to speak, and they needed somebody to pick him up, you know, and to drive him. And I said, oh, God, I want to meet Tennessee Williams. So it was rather crazy, because, oh, yes. Well, Miss Tully, hello, hi. Could you find me a pool? I would like to be in a big pool with a with a um, inner tube, with a what called like an inner, inner tube. tube. And uh, could we do that, please? And I went, oh sure. <laughs> <laughs> Who has a pool in Chicago? So we had to check into a room at a hotel or motel and and use their pool, which no one else was using. And then of course he wanted a quart of whiskey, and so he sat there drinking. And yes. Uh, uh, Tully, I said, yes, I believe I will have another whiskey if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, sure, Tennessee, I'll go out and get it for you. And, uh, so that was my day, was like shepherding Tennessee, Tennessee Williams, Williams around. thinking it would be a lot different than it turned out to be. <laughs> <laughs> but then years later, Bruce and Nancy, when he died, Bruce, Bruce Jarko and yes. Nancy Kelly from Second City were, were in New York. I said, oh, well, we should go and pay tribute to him. He was on the second floor at some <laughs> hotel on Broadway, and this is in the real seedy era of, of that uh, you know place in New York. And so they go up to the second floor and there's nobody else there. It's just Tennessee in, in a coffin. And they cannot believe that this big star is in this crummy coffin in this Aww. crappy hotel and he's all alone. So that was kind of a, uh, a bummer. But, um, but to meet him though, he was like a lot of the people I'm talking about, they were just had a, a flow to them and they were like, bigger than life. And, you, know. yeah. you have so many stories and you've met so many people throughout um, your time. Uh, and it all started essentially with Second City. How, yeah. did, how did you find your way to Second City? You know, it's funny. I had a, a fellow law student, uh, Howie was his name, and he wanted to audition. And he found out all about it, but he was too frightened to go alone. And I said, all right, I'll go with that. I was in law school. And, uh, and so uh, uh, Howie goes and he auditions. And, um, and, uh, and then I audition, you know. And Del goes, oh, uh, uh, all right, uh, uh, you can go. And then so we get up and say, okay, thank you. And he goes, oh, oh, not you. And he, was, he dismissed Howie and, <laughs> and not me. Mm -hmm. And I went, okay. And so I made the class, you know. Right. And I just, and poor Howie never spoke to me again. <laughs> he was so upset. I'll go with you and I didn't. Yeah, I was just there to, you know, get, get, get him in. And I wound up being the person that got in. Now, so. was that a shift for you? Did you? Were you really on the path to becoming a lawyer? You know what? I was in law school for sure. I, I had got, I had got a theater theater degree at SIU. Oh, okay. And so, but then, and but I was a straight A student, and so I used that to get into law school. And um, I was also two S because it was Vietnam, Vietnam was going on. Right. And so I was able to remain in school and not go to Vietnam, there you go. which was a big deal for a lot of people yes. in those days, as you can imagine. Yeah. Now, along with Second City, you were also in so many other improv groups, the Reification Company. Yeah. Um, was there any other companies at that time? Because well, I that felt like they all was, bled together. Yeah, they sort of did, but we were the one original one. I was Bernadette Percat and um, Danny Breen, you yes. know, and Rob Riley. And uh, we were the original break-off group that Dell started, and Dell came up with the name. Who would name a group the Reification Company except for Dell? <laughs> and, I was wondering uh, where that title know, came from. totally Dell. And so I directed the group, and we had we were, we won a local Emmy, and we had the, yeah it was the beginning of everything with that, and um, you know Dell was just uh, great to work with, and uh, so many of the other people there that we got to know quite well at that time. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Now, what was the shift when you decided that you wanted to come to LA? Well, um, you know what I, I had I had I'd gone to a psychic 
And I don't really believe in that. It's so funny, I don't believe in that. But I thought, oh, somebody, somebody talked me into it. And she said, some event will happen to you on January 1st, 1980. Wow. And I went, okay. And you know what, I think it was almost a self-fulfilling prophecy because I closed my law office and I packed up my car and on January 1st, 1980, I left Chicago forever and came out here. So. Oh, wow. What was your first gig in LA? Well, I, we met this gal named Dee Marcus who had a uh, group called Off the Wall. And, uh, you know, and, and Robin Williams and, um, and uh, uh, John uh, Ritter, you yeah. know, and people like that, there we are, uh, had been uh, in the group. And so uh, after a while, we, uh, there's our old piano player, Ray Colcord in the back, oh, wow. Paul Wilson from Cheers, uh, what is it, real people, I guess, David Ruprecht was on, and Wendy Cutler and Andy Goldberg yes. and Bernard and I. And so we, we, we worked the weekends, and then we would do every uh, Monday night at the improv, as I said, for three hours. And you know who would often come is, is Robin Williams, who wow. I got to know quite well. And I can tell you a little bit about him yeah, if you want to hear. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, Why not? I love you've got all the, you're a broken tour. Of yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, didn't mean to be. But anyway, so um, Robin was great. We loved working with Robin, but it was impossible to get to know him as a person because he really kept himself. He was a very strange, he grew up at a, in a, very wealthy house, but he stayed in his room a lot. Mm -hmm. And so he created these worlds inside of his head. And he had a mind where he could memorize every comedic thing said or yes. done. And so that got him in a lot of trouble with like Tom Dreesen. He confronted him one night, you know, because Robin did his act basically. <laughs> and then another guy, the young uh, black guy had an act, had a thing where he would go, in those days, uh, brothers called themselves blood, hey blood. And so then plasma was coming around. And so he would do this joke where they would call each other, hey plasma, you know. Mm -hmm. And Robin stole that joke and, and, uh, and that guy almost, you know, wanted, he was yeah. really wanted to, 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 to kill him. But Robin did our show <laughs> and I didn't believe it. I didn't believe he would be that, you know, outrageous. But then he did our show and I would do Ted Koppel. And we would take a, uh, a uh, problem in the news, something, a story that everybody's talking about, some controversial thing, and I go, good evening, I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. Tonight on Nightline, the hostage situation. And then Robin would be one of my three guests, you know, and he would like play Pap, Coach Pap Smear. And I, go, <laughs> and I would go, Coach, I'm not sure why they booked you for the uh, program tonight, but it's always a pleasure to have uh, uh, Alabama Western uh, Coach uh, Coach, football coach, Pap Smear, a legend in the football. <laughs> well, here's what I do. I'd go over there and I don't. He would do these crazy characters and just kill. The audience just loved him. Oh, wow. But the, uh, the funny part about Robin was that um, he'd do like four great Mondays in a row. And then he'd have an off night, as everybody does. But he would grind. He'd start to go for it, you know, oh, wow. because he had to get the laughs. And then I did a joke once where I, it was during the Winter Olympics, and the Russian premier and drop off had died, and I said, and there was a new event called the Luge, and I said that the uh, Russians were were using the beleaguered body of of your and drop off, you know. <laughs> and the next night, I saw him when he was on stage. He did my exact joke. Uh -huh. He changed two words to, to make it a little better. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's the highest form of flattery. It really is because I was getting joke. these huge laughs, but it was somebody else doing my material. Yeah. It's very odd. That is hard. But we loved him very much, and we're very sad at his passing. As you know, that's just yeah. really a bright light. That I always say this about people like John Candy, John Belushi, and uh, you know um, Robin. Robin. And re recently, we lost from the Newhart show. You yes, know, that uh, gentleman was a, another good friend of mine. I'm blanking on his name, but um, anyway, uh, great comedians are never replaced. They're only endlessly um, imitated. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, if you think about it, an, an actor like Clark Gable will be replaced someday by George Clooney, you know, or Tyrone Power will die and Brad Pitt will come along. But somebody who's funny, they're uniquely funny in a way that only they can, can contribute to the world. And people like that, again, are never replaced. That's a good outlook. I don't think, you know, I've never thought of it that way, but that is true. Yeah, definitely. It's very they much have that true. certain persona. Yeah. How long were you. Um, or how long has Off the Wall been together since? Yeah, well, we, we stopped being together for a while because of my new show. But we, we, you know, what happened with Off the Wall was we began to do a lot, like uh, Wendy and Andy and I did a lot of um, candid cameras. And we also did right. Totally Hidden Video, and people do the craziest thing, and Dick Clark's, uh, you know, funny sh craziness stuff. And uh, I always said that film 
crews don't mind filming me, they just don't like to be seen doing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like working on all the hidden camera shots? Oh, it was great. You know, we'd, we'd go up to Seattle for a while. And, and one time we were in Seattle and I was playing a priest and we did this thing called Priest on a Leash. And <laughs> Dee Marcus, who had started off the wall, or older gal, great lady, was playing a nun and she had me on a leash and I was a priest. And I had just lost, like uh, allegedly had lost 29 pounds. And if I had one more pound to lose, I'd win this bet I had with all my kids at the school. But I love candy. So she would ask people to hold on to me while she had to go somewhere so that I couldn't get candy. And then we'd have people walk by with candy and I'd try to grab it. <laughs> I mean, it's a stupid bit, but people said, all right, you know. And, and so then she gave it to this guy who I later found out his name was Bruno, who was a, who was a heroin addict. Who was living in the park? Oh dear! And, and he get, and he had me really, you know, like he was like choke me. I said, okay, this is actually Canon camera. Come on out, you guys! <laughs> and I could hear them on the IB, IFB laughing, you know, because they were like thought this was hysterical. And I'm getting crushed by this guy. And, and he said to me, Father, you probably want that candy as much as I want a bag of heroin. <laughs> That was, yeah. That's amazing. That's, that's candid camera for you. We did it all over the country. We went to Boston, Chicago, and you know, Florida. And we found out that different audiences, people in different cities react yeah. differently. People in New York are much more animated. People in Arizona are like, you know, like the doll factory, you know, like nobody <laughs> reacted. We would do all this crazy stuff and no one would react to things. So that was very interesting to see how different cities were, uh, you know, How long react. did you do that for? We did that for two and a half years. Wow. And it was with Dom DeLuise, who was a wonderful, wonderful yes. man. Amazing. Very funny guy. Oh, wow. So the show that you're currently working on right now, yeah. which is called Top Tune. That's right. That's which the show. I actually have a, I have a clip, um, a little snippet of. Oh, good. And then we, and then we <coughs> have questions. <laughs> competitive songwriting show featuring six of LA's best singer-songwriters. We're going to pair them up into teams of two, Team A, Team B, and Team C. And then we're going to give them an original title and 17 minutes to write a new song. Yeah. 17 so, minutes? Why 17 minutes? I don't know. My partner came up with that. <laughs> uh, it just sounded good, you know. It does. I was just curious if there was like a I, You know, he said it and I went, yeah, that's a good idea. Just, you know, like again, I went along with it, you know, the story of my life. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll get in the car and go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> so what happened was I had, we had done a show called Top Tale, which was a storytelling show, and we made it competi competitive, and we used three uh, celebrity judges, you know. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, because uh, I had read this article in, the, in Vanity Fair about the old Brill Building in New York where the, all the songs were written in the 60s that were such big hits. And so um, Jerry Geffen and his partner were young guys, and they, had, and they wrote big hits, but they had been sloughing off, sloughing, sloughing off all week. And so the secretary goes, goes and says, hey, you know, you guys, you have a meeting with the vice president a, a, in an hour. And they, and they remembered they had promised this guy three new songs, and they had nothing. So they challenged themselves, and they said, we're going to write three songs in one hour. And the first two songs were eminently forgettable, but the third song they wrote in five minutes called Who Put the Bomb in the Bomb Shit Bomb Shit Bomb. <laughs> and it was a big hit. It wasn't a great song, but it, but it had humor. And it sold over a million copies. And I said, Damn it, if somebody can do that for uh, write a song in five minutes, yeah. we can have two people that have never met write a song in 17 minutes and then perform it. And, and the show has turned into a hit, and uh, we have a deal coming with it. And Keegan was one of our celebrity judges. Yeah, I was going to say, so who were some of the judges? In Joe Montaigne, you know, and we had, um, see, we have a musician and a comedian and an actor. So we've had like uh, Rick Overton and Don Myrera. And those are the judges? Yeah, and they, they're three judges. And, uh, you know, of course, Jimmy's done the show a number of times, Jim Belushi. And, uh, he, you know, you and I did Jimmy's show. Yeah, we, we did. We were on that. The Defenders together. Yeah, that's right. Oh, he's been great. It was lots of fun there. Good man. And he's, he is another guy that got me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> it happens. Do we have time for a quick we Jim do Belushi have, We do story? have time. All right, Jim Belushi story. Uh, when Jim came out, you know, John uh, was quite famous, and they, and they said, well, where's there, is there another one? And of course they do that, you know, and they went, yeah, there's Jim Belushi, and of course he was much younger, you know, and he'd just gotten on Second City, and he was really just getting started. And so he came out here, and we had some really wild times, and I had this very pretty girlfriend named Coralie, and so uh, I was asleep with her in this big house, and uh, she had these two roommates, Lorelai and uh, Robin. 
And so Jimmy had been dating Robin, this tall gal, real nice gal, and, um, and, and Lorelai had been out of town. But we went in her room and saw these pictures of her. She was a very busty and beautiful gal. And she was Tony Curtis's uh, love slave. And they had pictures of her dressed up in leather and, and Tony with a whip, you know. And, and we were like, OK. So, so we got out of there. And uh, so I'm, I'm asleep one night with, with CJ. And there's a knock at the door, and it's Robin. And Coralie goes, what's the matter? And she goes, oh, Jimmy's disappeared. I don't know where he is. And so, and so I said, is, is his car here? Yeah. Oh, no. I said, OK, uh, tell her to go back to her room. I'll find him. Of course, I knew where he was. He was with Lorelai. So <laughs> I, uh, I go over to him. Jimmy, Jim? Yeah, yeah, what is it? I said, it's Tom, Tim. Uh, yeah, yeah, listen, you have to go back to Robin now. You're putting me in a lot of, you're getting me in a lot of trouble here. Just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. OK, OK, OK. So, the, so he goes back. And that kind of thing oh, would God. happen all the time. Just terrible stuff, but really funny. <laughs> <laughs> you truly are like the mayor of improv. You know everyone, all the stories. You've I seen do. it all. You've heard it all. You go along with everything. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, we've come to this time of the show where I like to do something called the Candy Connection. Okay. Which is kind of like six degrees of separation of Kevin Bacon, except you do it with six degrees of John Candy, my dad. Okay. So uh, I think I'm, I think I've got this one going. Okay. So you were in Second City, the touring company, mm -hmm. and my dad was also in Second City. Right. That's one degree of separation. Okay. That's only one. I can do better. So uh, you were, you worked with Robin Williams. Robin Williams was in SETV uh, in sketches with my dad, who was also in SATV. That's right, there's two degrees separate. Okay, hold on, I can do better than two. Okay, so you were in The Defenders with Jerry O'Connell. Yeah. Jerry O'Connell was in Stand By Me with Kiefer Sutherland. Yes. Kiefer Sutherland was with Tom Cruise and A Few Good Men. Okay. And then Tom Cruise was in Rain Man with Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman was in Meet the Fockers with Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller is married to Christine Taylor. Mm -hmm. Christine Taylor was Marsha Brady in the Brady Bunch movie <laughs> with Shelley Long, who yeah. played Mrs. Brady in the Brady Bunch movie. Shelley Long was also in Cheers with George Wendt. Yep. George Wendt was in Hostage for a Day with John Candy, thus giving us our candy connection. Very Woo! good. All right. Oh, you're out of okay, what a pleasure. What Thank a pleasure. you so much Thank for doing all. this. Thank, Thank you guys so much for coming out. <laughs> Thank you.